You're in the Pokemon world, eking out a meager existence as a berry farmer. One day, you go to check on your lovingly raised berry crop, when, hey, with it all, those damned Rotata. They've been nothing but trouble ever since they got here. So you go to your region's professor, who looks through the Pokedex to find a Rotata predator. They release it onto the land, Rotata populations drop and all is well. Wait, why does only one pull on the plants? Where'd all the birds go? Unbeknownst to you, the predator you release went after bird eggs, decimating the bird Pokemon which once preyed on caught pests. This isn't a plot out of some sci-fi horror, but something which happened in the Hawaiian Islands, where mongooses introduced to control rats preyed on several native birds and turtles to extinction. But what if there was another way to control pests without the use of chemicals or introducing predators into the ecosystem? Allow me to introduce you to gene drives, by which genes can be spread throughout a population even if they harm their host. First, a refresher on the Mendelian model of how traits are passed down from parent to child. In diplot organisms, we have two copies of our genome in the form of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. To reproduce, diplot organisms first produce gametes in a process called meiosis, which differ from regular cells in that they only have one chromosome. In meiosis, chromosomes from both parents are recombined, such that each gamete contains a different combination of genes. As a result, whether any given offspring receives any given gene is a matter of chance. But how can a harmful gene spread throughout a population? If a gene made its host less likely to survive, wouldn't it be less likely to reproduce and pass the gene on? Usually, that would be true. However, selfish genes shatter the classic Mendelian paradigm of genetic inheritance by ensuring that they are transmitted more likely than chance. In 2003, Austin Bird demonstrated that such genes could be the basis of a system of genetic modification, which we today call the gene drive. While there are many selfish genes, Bird focuses on the homing endonuclease gene, or HEG for short. HEGs encode homing endonucleases, which are proteins that recognize a specific DNA sequence, cuts both copies of it, and inserts the HEG into the middle of the recognition sequence of one copy. When the cell realizes that there's DNA damage, a DNA repair mechanism called homology directed repair comes along and uses the unbroken copy as a template to synthesize and repair the broken strand, reproducing the HEG. Whenever the HEG is read by the cell, a new homing endonuclease is produced which can repeat the cycle again. With their combination of specific targeting and ability to self-replicate, researchers have been interested in using HEGs to drive new genes into a population since the 1990s. However, Bird proposed an interesting modification on this idea. What if a selfish gene could insert itself into an important gene and knock it out in the process? Remember how you have two copies of each gene from each parent? If you have two different copies of the same gene, that's something known as heterozygosity. In many genes, you can remain healthy even if one copy doesn't function, as the other one will usually pick up the slack. If you use HEG insertion to knock out such genes, then individuals with one copy of the HEG will be able to survive and reproduce. However, due to the HEG's copying ability, they would always produce gametes with the HEG. But that's not all. In animals, we have stretches of DNA called promoters, which help transcription proteins to come along and start the process of turning DNA downstream of them into RNA to be made into proteins which perform key functions. If you insert a HEG after a promoter which is only targeted during meiosis, then the HEG will only be replicated in cells which end up in the host's offspring. This ensures that all of the host's offspring will carry the HEG, whilst preventing the HEG from activating in the host and harming its chances of reproducing. Together, meiosis-specific promoters allow HEG carriers to reproduce unharmed and spread the HEG, while site-specific recessive knockouts ensure that if two HEG carriers meet, their offspring will always receive two copies of the HEG and experience the effects. Hence, gene drives could be used to ensure that nearly every member of a population contains an introduced gene. It's actually been done before. Instead of using HEGs, researchers have used the RNA guide and the nucleus Cas9 to cut and insert new genes in what is now famously known as the CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive. Such experiments have been done before to render mosquitoes unable to transmit deadly diseases such as malaria, as well as to control invasive rodent populations. Yet, there is considerable debate on whether to use gene drives. We have never edited the genome of a wild species with such self-sustaining tools before. Unlike previous genetically modified organisms, gene drives will likely spread throughout exposed populations within a few generations. Hence, if a gene drive has unexpected side effects, we may not get a chance to reverse it until it is too late. Furthermore, gene drives have no respect for geopolitical barriers. If one nation decides to release gene drive equipped animals, they will almost certainly spread their genes into animals living in neighboring countries, whether their neighbors consent to it or not. On the other hand, gene drives can help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Malaria kills over 400,000 people a year, while invasive species have been implicated in the extinction of 134 species. Additionally, gene drive introduction can be reversed if it proves problematic. 
Individuals can be released with a functional copy of the original gene, with slight edit, such that the homing endonucleus can no longer recognize it. Within a few generations, the resistant gene should outcompete the gene drive from the population and restore previous function. Hence, it is possible to reverse a misused gene drive, although the genetics of the population may never become what it was before the gene drive was introduced. As gene drives become easier to produce, we as a society will have to find an answer to the use of gene drives. On one side, 400,000 lives a year and our remaining biodiversity. On the other lies humanity's greatest fear, the unknown. What is your stance?